big news came to David that the Philistines were at Keilah stealing grain from the threshing floors. And David asked the Lord, should I go and attack them? So what does David do? If you recall, he's on the run. He's kind of an outlaw. King Saul is after him, wanting to arrest him and have him killed. And David has gathered this band of rebels around him, this band of outcasts, and there's like 400 of them, and it's growing. And he's kind of become this, this hero out in the wilderness, but he's very much feeling rejected. He's having to live in caves. He's on the run. And his life is always sort of under threat. So he's stressed out to the max, but he's a man of God, a man after God's own heart. So he's in all of this, trying to live the way God wants him to live. And that's challenging, but that's what the Bible is for, for life in difficult circumstances, which is all of us, I think. We all have different circumstances that are difficult. And uh, the, the Bible and the example of David are for those situations where life is tough. That's exactly what it's for. It is for today, 2023, to live like this. And so David is out with his band, his group, and he hears that an enemy nation is raiding this city along the border named Keilah, K-E-I-L-A-H, Keilah, and they're, they're, they're raiding their crops, and they're stealing the crops from the threshing floors, and David is seeing this going on, an enemy nation attacking his people, he's an outcast of his own people, right? He's an outcast of Israel. But David is like, I gotta do something about this. Even though I'm not even accepted by my own government, by my own leadership, I still, I feel I need to do the right thing here. Even though he, he doesn't have a professional army with him, he doesn't have a bunch of police officers or something, he's got his, his gang of, uh, of outcasts with him. He's got a bunch of farmers with pitchforks and, you know, uh, guys with clubs and sticks and whatever they can find. And he, but, but he says, I got to do something. So he, in verse 2, David goes in prayer and he says, God, should I go and attack the Philistines and defend the city of Keilah? And, and God answers him right away and says, yes, go and save Keilah. And I'm sure David felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit within him saying, go do this. And we as Christians, of course, experience the same thing whenever God tells us, go help this person, go pray for this person, go, go work your job today. We just feel a conviction to do the right thing. And then we go and we obey. Point number one, David prays and asks for God's permission before he takes a new course of action. Now, David could have said, okay, I'm going. But he doesn't. He, he prays first. He stops, okay, I'm going to pray about this before I do something. And what am I always telling everyone here? Before you make a big decision, you got to pray about it. Ask God what to do. And if you don't, you're going to be running your own life, and you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> and it's going to be bad. Uh, when we are not following God's will, we will often blunder our way into situations that are not uh, good. So... Ask God's permission. Pray about it. Now, if you're thinking about going to the store, listen, you don't need to pray about that, okay? Just go to the store. Thinking, okay, I, I gotta go to the gas station and get gas. Just do it. <laughs> you don't need to pray about every little decision, but when there's a big decision, I just wanna remind people to stay in your seats until this, the message is over, okay? But David's men said, we're afraid even here in Judah. We certainly don't want to, Kila, to go to Keilah to fight the whole Philistine army. So David goes to the Lord, God says yes, and David then uh, goes to his men and says, guys, we are gonna go save the city of Keilah from the Philistines. We're gonna go save the city. And his men are like, uh, what? We're a bunch of farmers with pitchforks. How are we supposed to go fight a professional army? Are you nuts? 
It'd be like if us got together and said, we're gonna go to Ukraine and fight against the, uh, the Russians. Not the best idea normally, right? And we'd say, uh, what, Pastor? So David's like, let's go. And his men are like, uh, I don't think so. That sounds like a bad idea. Um, we are already afraid, even here in Judah. He says, in our home country, we're afraid of King Saul's forces. We're afraid of the armies that are searching for us. How can we go and fight another battle? Point number two, David has to trust God more than his own soldiers who are already afraid and on the run. But David sees the big picture. He's not held down by the feelings of his own people. He sees beyond that. So David asked the Lord again, it says in verse four, and again the Lord replied, go down to Keilah, for I will help you conquer the Philistines. So point number three today, David double checks with God in that situation. Sometimes it's wise for us to do the same thing. We think we heard from God, okay, God's kind of leading, nudging me in this direction. And we think we know what to do, but maybe it, sometimes it might be wise to check with God again, just to be sure. I don't know, sometimes you think you know which way to go, then you're kind of like, huh, oh, is this right? You think, well, maybe I'll pray again. And then God says, uh, yeah, you were way off base there. <laughs> Don't do that. Or he says, yeah, that's what I said. I, 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 I meant it, and go do it. So verse 5, uh, David and his men went to Keilah. They slaughtered the Philistines and took all their livestock and rescued the people of Keilah. Now, in verse 6, now when Abiathar uh, fled to David at Keilah, he brought the ephod with him. Interesting. Point number 4. David had been going to God directly. Certainly a good thing to do. But David realizes, wait, I have a pastor I can go to about these questions about, about God. This is a good thing. He realizes he has Abiathar with him, who is a priest. So I'm going to go talk to Abiathar about this situation. I'm going to go talk to one of my spiritual leaders before I make a decision. It's a good thing to do. So verse 7, Saul soon learned, soon learned that David was at Keilah. Good, he exclaimed, we've got him now. God has handed him over to me, for he has trapped himself in a walled city. So Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Keilah and besiege David and his men. I mean, the entire Israelite army, that's got, that's got to be somewhere between 80 and 120,000 men. That's a lot of troops. So he mobilizes the entire army. That's how much he wants to get rid of David, this king in exile, this leader in exile. He mobilizes the entire army to attack Keilah. But it says in verse 9, But David learned of Saul's plan and told Abiathar the priest to bring the ephod, that's like a, looks like a holy garment, and ask the Lord what he should do. Then David prayed, O Lord God of Israel, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy Keilah because I am here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me to him? And will Saul actually come as I have heard? Oh, Lord God of Israel, please tell me. You ever pray like that? God, please tell me. Please, God, tell me. Help. I pray like that sometimes. Please, God, help me. And the Lord said, he will come. He says, Saul is coming, David. He is coming. And again, David asked him, will the leaders of Keilah betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, yes, they, they will betray you. So David has just saved this city from the Philistines. And the leaders of, of the city are going to betray David anyway. Which, that's a really low thing to do, isn't it? David just saved your city. But Keilah is now surrounded by Saul's army. <laughs> so what do you do? I mean, you're surrounded by like 100,000 troops. And what do you do? You've you, you got to give up David, otherwise Saul's going to destroy the whole city. Right? Still, it's a low thing to do because David just saved your life. Your lives from the Philistines. Meanwhile, uh, your own army of Israel wasn't helping you at all. But then they come just to get David instead of helping defend you from the Philistines. Is that, is that right? No. But there's all sorts of situations in this, like, in life where it just seems like there's no right course to take. Ever notice that? 
seems like it's just uh, a bunch of gray areas and it's like, what do I do? There's no good course ahead for me. And those are the times when we gotta get on our face before God and say, God help me, what should I do? So, so David and his men, and he's got about 600 guys with him now. So he, it was 400, he's gained another 200 followers. They left Keilah and began roaming the countryside. So he's just, they're just running out in fields. Word soon reached Saul that David had escaped, so he didn't go to Keilah at all. He says, all right, I don't have to deal with it then. David now stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness in the hill country of Ziph. Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him. That's an interesting thing right there. The Bible says God prevented Saul from finding David. Just prevent, just blocked from, from finding David. That's point number five today. God will give you favor as you follow him. David asked God if he should stay or go. The Lord tells him to leave. Don't make your stand there. Go hide. And Saul keeps searching for David, but the Lord makes sure Saul doesn't find him. I don't know if you've ever felt God's favor over your life, but man, ever since becoming a Christian 10 years ago, after, after being a, a, an alcoholic and an addict all those years, I'll tell you, uh, he has prevented a lot of disasters in my life by about that much sometimes, but like, you know, you just realize I was in the right place at the right time there, otherwise it would not have worked out. And th there's been times where maybe someone at this church is struggling or, or angry or upset or something, and I'll just happen to be in the right place at the right time to run into them. And it just works out in a really interesting way, very serendipitous is the word uh, that is used, kind of things can kind of flow together into this pattern. It's kind of interesting. I noticed that since becoming a Christian, and e even in my life as an, as an addict, God also like prevented my death about five times. I mean, very, in, very clearly, I mean, even suicide attempts, God sovereignly would protect me where I wouldn't die. And that's God's favor and his grace and his help. So it's interesting. God protects us, even from our own bad choices sometimes. And with David, we've seen that again and again and again on this journey of the man after God's own heart is circumstances line up in a certain way for him to be in the right place at the right time to meet the right person who later helps him to nearly uh, escape. But he's, he's constantly tested as well Will you make the right choice in this situation? Are you gonna uh, t take a shortcut and to do something bad, do something evil? Or are you gonna do the right and hard thing for God, which often makes more trouble for you in the short term? And we are challenged in the same way each day. Am I gonna read my Bible or am I gonna play on my phone? Am I gonna pray or am I gonna watch TV? And each time we take a shortcut, we are hurting ourselves. Each time we say, you know, meh, whatever. We've, we've just made a choice that is influencing our future destiny, whichever way it's gonna go. And those choices are actually more vital than I think we realize. So in those moments, I found that in life, one of the biggest things in life is doing what you don't want to do in the moment for, to, to point towards something better in the future. And the more I deny myself, the, the more my life goes down the right path. The more I indulge myself, the more it kind of drifts into a bad way. And uh, just so, something as simple as showing up at church or going to your recovery group or going to Bible study or praying those little decisions you make are culminating toward a particular path in your life. And it's either going to be that path of God's will or the path of destruction. I mean, there's not a lot of in-between. So those are the choices we make. But God is with David. 
says in verse 15, one day near Horesh, David received the news that Saul was on the way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. So Saul finds out he's in Ziph. Let's go. Uh, Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith to God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan uh, reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. So the two of them renewed their solemn pact before the Lord. Then Jonathan returned home while David stayed at Horish. So his friend, his best friend, Jonathan, comes out and meets with David and says, don't, don't you worry, I am still your best friend. I am with you. You are going to be the king of Israel. Everything's going to be okay. Hang in there, okay? David uh, reaffirms his, his pact with Jonathan. That's point number six today. Even when friends are far away, God will from time to time renew the brotherhood or sisterhood between them. Distance cannot affect it. Distance cannot affect it. But now the men of Ziph went to Saul in Gibeah and betrayed David to him. We know where David is hiding, they said. They said he is in the stronghold of Horesh on the hill of Hakila, which is in the southern part of Jeshimon. Come down whenever you're ready, O king, and we will catch him and hand him over to you. So he's betrayed by the people of Ziph now. Constant problems, right? Constant problems. Do you ever have days like that or weeks like that or years like that? Constant problems. Why won't they stop? For David, constant problems. He's, he's the anointed of God. He's, the love, he's loved by God. He is affirmed by God. Constant problems. That, that's it. It's, it's just because you're loved by God doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. There's going to be problems. That's okay. Realize that and accept that. I'm a Christian. I'm going to have some issues. That's okay, God is with me, and, it, and just because something bad happens does not mean that he's left me. He has not left me. He has not forsaken me because tough things are happening. That's not it. We will have bad stuff happen. We must believe that God is with us in that bad stuff. Now, there is a difference between bad stuff and stuff where we caused it, too, okay? <laughs> you know, I go home and I smoke a bowl and, and you know, you pop some acid. I mean, guess what? Bad stuff's going to happen because I made some dumb choices. Okay? Yeah. Bad stuff's going to happen. If I go looking at porn on my phone, bad stuff's going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not a joke. Bad stuff will happen. I'm, I'm, I'm charting the course of evil with that. And I should expect to reap destruction. Yeah. Like yeah one, okay. uh, once we know better... Then it's, then it's a choice, right? We're making a choice to you. I'm talking about God, though. I'm not. God will deal with you. You can believe it if you're living in sin. You're not going to go to heaven, right? In any case, let's finish up here. It says, the Lord bless you, Saul said. At last, someone is concerned about me. So Saul's excited. He says, all right, they're helping me out. Go and check again to be sure where he's staying. Who has seen him there? For I know he is very crafty. He says, David's a crafty one, and I want to get him. Discover his hiding places and come back when you are sure. Then I'll go with you. And if he is in the area at all, I'll track him down, even if I have to search every hiding place in Judah. So the men of Ziph returned home ahead of Saul. Meanwhile, David and his men had moved into the wilderness of Maon in the Arabah Valley, south of Jeshimon, when David heard that Saul and his men were searching for him, he went even farther into the wilderness to the great rock, this giant rock in the wilderness, and he remained there in the wilderness. But Saul kept after him, even in the wilderness. And point number seven, even when the walls are closing in, we can trust God. The citizens of Ziph betray David and his men, and they have to go even deeper into the wilderness to the great rock. And Jesus Christ is our great rock. We can run to him and find safety. Jesus Christ, the savior of the world, who loves us and died for us, who bled and died to cover our sins so that we could have a clean slate, a fresh start. That is our great rock that we can run to in the wilderness, and that's what I did. That's what I did when I was lost in addiction. I finally found that rock bottom where Jesus Christ was the rock. 
And he washed away my sins, removed my addictions, and set me on a new course of life. And he can do the same for you today. Jesus Christ is real. He is a living Savior. He's in the room right now. You get that? He's with God's people. Present here. Willing to change your life. If you call out to the name of Jesus. Jesus save me. He will be the great rock that you can run to. Hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. Well, you got to call out. You got to say Jesus I'm done. I give up. I can't do this on my own. I don't want to. I've sinned against you, Lord Jesus. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I've done wrong. Make me clean, Jesus. You gotta cry out to the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. That's it. He's that great rock, though. So it says, Saul and David were now on opposite sides of a mountain. Just as Saul and his, men, and his men began to close in on David and his men, an urgent message reached Saul that the Philistines were raiding Israel again. So Saul quit chasing David and refer, returned to fight the Philistines. Ever since that time, the place where David was camped has been called the Rock of Escape. The Rock of Escape. David then went to live in the stronghold of En Gedi. And again, point number seven is reinforced here. Our last point for today. David is on the run and he's on one side of the mountain, Saul's on the other, Saul's closing in on him, or he's about to catch him. And what does God do? God works it out so that Saul gets a message, the Philistines are attacking and he's about to find, he's like, oh, I gotta go, okay. David's safe. Woo, wow, that's close. And guess what, there's been times, even as a Christian, where I, I'm at the brink, man, I can barely hold on. God doesn't, God doesn't prevent that moment, but he helps me in that moment. He does again and again and again. Praise the Lord. And that great rock was called henceforth the rock of escape. Jesus is our rock of escape from the sins and destruction of this world. And he is coming soon, brothers and sisters. You see the world falling apart. You see these diseases and wars and famines and inflation happening. You better get ready today because he is coming soon. I believe that. I believe we will see his coming in my lifetime. There is not a doubt in my mind that I will see the return of Jesus. That's how close we are. That's how close we are. We already see the World Economic Forum preparing. In 10 years, you will own nothing and like it, they say. Interesting, isn't it? It's all happening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we see what David did. We see how he trusted you. That didn't stop problems, God, but you delivered him from all of them, God, so thank you. Lord Jesus Christ, you are our rock of escape. You are our great rock, and we turn to you. We take refuge in you, Jesus. We find safety in this wilderness of sin and destruction. In this world, God, we turn to you. Make us clean, make us pure. By your precious blood shed for us, Jesus, we believe in you today. In Jesus' name, amen.